So after losing in horrible, inglomious and tragic fashion in round 6 of Hroningen Open, in round 7 I got paired down uh, against a overrated player from India with a rating around 2030. Would I be able to bounce back? Would I be able to finally play a decent game? Well, let's dive deep and find out in this video. So when I saw the pairings for this round, I wasn't really happy. Uh, I saw that I have an Indian opponent who was doing really, really well in the tournament. Um, and you know, usually we are afraid of Indian opponents, especially young opponents. Uh, this one was not that young, he was 30 years of age, but the, the, his feeder profile was somewhat weird because he didn't, he started playing chess very, very late. He didn't play that many tournaments and he also had the title of Arena Grandmaster, meaning that he played a lot of online. So it was very difficult for me to, first of all, uh, mentally approach this game. Uh, because I'm sort of a favorite, but you are, you know, facing an unknown and there is a lot of fear and nerves involved, especially after you play such a horrible game in round in the previous round. I didn't have that many information on what he's going to play, what might be his repertoire, so it was really, really annoying to go there and to play the game where you know that you are kind of a sitting duck, he can prepare whatever he wants. He, You probably assume that he will prepare, I mean, people don't travel all the way from India for Christmas and in order not to prepare and in general these players do know their theory so I had really really a lot of struggles before the game um, and ultimately I, I decided basically to you know devoid any preparation and just to play what I usually play and then see what happens because I, I really have zero info on what he might play what what I might expect so I opened the game with e4 and he went for c5. Now, I did see that he plays either c5 or e5, but that was such a limited pool of games that I, I didn't have much to go for. And instead of this bishop e2, which I played against Virs, I decided to go for the main with knight f3. And to be fair, he, he was knowing, he knew what he was doing because he arrived to the game, he thought for a while after his first move, and he took some time on all these initial moves, so knight f3, d6, d4, cd4, knight d4, knight f6. Like, I knew that he was prepared, he was maybe trying to fool me, but I'm not stupid. Uh, and once I played f3, he started bleeding. So f3 is my standard Sicilian, uh, about which I also made a course on chessable. And I said, okay, I'll just play this. If he knows it, then he knows it. I mean, I, I, I don't, I, I'm confident that in most of my lines, I know them well, and at least I will not be worse. So we'll at least get the game in a structure that I'm familiar with. So he play, went for this line with e5, knight b3, d5. Bishop g5, bishop b6, the so-called endgame line, a very safe approach uh, for black that kind of allows them to equalize, but that leads to this endgame where white is also not risking uh, uh, that much. Now, I uh, I kind of thought that he would be playing for a draw, and it was it's very annoying when people uh, do play for a draw, and to be fair, I kind of don't understand why he would go all the way from India and then play for a draw. Uh, but okay, maybe there are reasons that I don't know which. I did speak to him uh, after the game. He said he's a coach, so maybe his his rating and his profile is also, uh, you know, relevant. But um, yeah, I was I was kind of surprised or you know under underwhelmed with the opening choice because after bishop f6, gf6, ed5, queen d5, uh, queen d5, bishop d5, knight c3, bishop e6, castles. Uh, he played this move knight c6, which is already the first. Uh, you know, sign that he was not combative because knight d7 is another different line. And then after I played bishop b5, he played rook c8. This move was recommended by Anish Giri in Lifetime Repertoire Snyder. And ever since, everybody, everybody has been playing it. This is actually the second time I faced this in the last six months. I also had one game in Pardubice Open where another Indian opponent <laughs> played this. So if you want to play for a win as black here, you have to play something like rook to g8. Or I think that's the alternative that Giri mentions. Because after rook c8, there is knight d5, and uh, if uh, whenever black takes this knight, I'm happy to get rid of this white square bishop and then play on these white squares. But the problem is after f5, uh, there is this drawing line with uh, sorry with knight f6, king e7, knight d5, and like. At this point, he kind of made this move and kind of looked at me, and I saw that he was maybe hoping for a draw. And I kind of, when I was working on a course, I expected that this line might be a problem, especially when playing lower-rated opponents. So I devised this bishop a4. This is, by the way, we were both blitzing. I was still in my preparation. This is all in the course. And I actually had that game that, that was exactly the same. So after bishop h6, king b1. Here he played king f8. And I did kind of check this before the game because I didn't come here empty-handedly. I did uh, assume that he might go for this line, so then I just repeated some some variations in, in the sprints. And um, after 95, I was still in my prep, so I was pretty much blitzing as well. And here he started thinking. 
And I knew that the main move here is an ID4, and then there is some sort of complications, not unfavorable for 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 black, but black needs to know what they are doing. Uh, he played king g7, and here I was a little bit confused because I couldn't recall uh, what's my analysis here. Um, this move is also fine for black, though, and but okay, it's maybe less queen than knight d4. And here I spent some time calculating this knight b7, knight d4 line. Uh, and then after knight d3, there is this rook c3, b c3. A very similar idea works in some different lines with the bishop on b5, for example. Uh, the point is knight e2, king b2, and then rook b8. And here I didn't calculate the computer line which goes bishop c6, bishop e8, rook d8, uh, bishop g5, rook e8. This looks super, super messy, but apparently it's not so easy for black to disentangle the pieces. And actually white might hope for some advantage because of the extra exchange. Um, so yeah, I didn't see that. <laughs> so I decided to play a bit more human and I took on e6. He took fe6. I took on c6 as well to ruin the structure. And... Uh, he took with the rook. I, I, taking with the pawn is also not so stupid because then um, it does look weird to isolate the pawns. But the problem is that after uh, c5, my knight is being pushed away. And uh, even though the pawn structure is bad, the bishop is good. There is some potential pressure along the g file. And this is approximately equal. Uh, I'm not even sure what I should play here, to be completely honest. I, I, I stopped here and assumed that it's fine for black. So yeah, this this is probably not, not that good. Uh, we're taking with the rook because now after knight before uh, he played rook c7. I expected he would go rook c4, uh, rook e7, king f6, rook b7, e4. Uh, but yeah, I guess it's not so easy to just give up the pawn and then to play for this e4 pawn. I wasn't sure if I would what I would do there, whether I would go for knight for knight d3 as well or or actually taken the bait. But okay, rook c7 is a very human move to prevent rook d7. And here I was in a kind of conundrum. I wanted to win this pawn, but I didn't know how to do it. Uh, I was contemplating like rook e1, king f6, knight d3, but now he plays rook d8 and I can't take because of the pin. And here I fail to appreciate that I'll still win the pawn, for example, e2, rook cd7, rook e1, rook d5, a3. And yeah, I'm winning this pawn, uh, and Stockfish gives some edge to white. So this was probably my chance to play for a win. Uh, I played knight d3 here because I was kind of trying to be smart with the move order. The idea was maybe to prevent some knight c5 tricks and then to be able to play rook e1 on the next move, for example. Uh, but still, um, I wasn't sure, like, for example, what happens in this one after king f6. And also I was bothered with this rook hc8, c3, c3 and now king f6. Because now if I play rook h2 e1, then there is rook d7, king c2, rook c d8. And now I'm, like, this pin on the defile is constantly annoying me. And I actually has to be careful like stockfish will say this is equal but i can't move the knight because then rook d2 comes and yeah i was i wasn't too sure if i would go for this or if i would play rook h2 one or if i would i don't know move the knight but i thought that you know with this black central pawn mess i might be in some danger if if, if i don't put pressure on it so i was worried more about rook hc8 and this is the best move which is why knight d3 is not most precise uh, anyway uh, he went e4 which was a huge surprise for me because yeah this just gives up kind of a pawn, or it makes this pawn much, much weaker. It's a very committal move uh, and a very risky decision. After fe4, fe4, knight f2, e3, knight g4, I'm hitting the bishop, I'm hitting the pawn, and this pawn is very much gone sooner or later. It's too weak. The only question is whether black will be able to gain some counterplay and create some threats in the meantime. Uh, my opponent played rook f8 here. Uh, I expected bishop f4, to be honest, because uh, I thought g3, h5 is the trick, so counter-attack on the knight. Uh, but after rook h1, uh, I, then h5, I can just take the pawn. And uh, I thought he could take on h2, and I thought this was equal, but the computer will point out that I can attack the bishop and take on e6. So moves rook e6. And okay, it's still not much, but it's a pawn, and white is definitely the one pushing for some sort of advantage. Um, okay, instead he played rook f8. I played rook e1 attacking the pawn, and here he played with this smart move, uh, bishop to g5, uh, intending to basically play h5 next, and forcing me to take on e3, um, kinda. Uh, I played c3 here, I didn't want to play knight e3 because then he can take or he can go rook f2 immediately. I was actually considering rook e2 here, but then, uh, and uh, in the game I actually miscalculated. I thought rook f4 is winning for him, uh, knight e3, rook e4, and I somehow imagined I'm lost, but I can simply defend the knight, and it's always good. However, it turns out that it was a lucky blunder, because 
after rookie 2, rookie 4 is actually winning because now after knight 3, rookie 4, black wins because now this rook is on the open file and if I defend, he takes, he takes and checkmates me. Uh, which so with with the other rook on on c7 there is no checkmate but with the rook on f8 there is mate so yeah small difference but a big difference in the outcome. Uh, so I played c3 here and this is actually the strongest move even though it was based on a small miscalculation I was kind of making a useful move restricting this rook and waiting me for him to force me to take the pawn on e3. I thought that would be an improvement, which he did. He played h5 and by the way here I, he was very low on time. He had only 16 minutes and I had like an hour and 10. And I started playing a bit too fast, which is an old weakness of mine. I was still a little bit tilted from the game the previous day, I guess. I, I was playing like... I was not at my best state, I would say. But still, that's not an excuse. I shouldn't do this. And this is when it happened. Knight e3, rook f2. And now I was like a bit unnerved by my opponent's counterplay. I didn't see how to deal with this pressure, how to prevent these pawns from... from how to keep them. Uh, However, there, 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 there are some ways, and I, and I actually con contemplated the move knight c2, but then after rook g2, knight d4, I kind of gave up on the variation for some reason. Uh, for example, after rook e7, knight e6, king h6. Um, but the engine does give white some uh, some edge, and more importantly, white is never in danger. Uh, similarly, after h3, bishop e3, rook e3, uh, rook, rook g2, rook e6, I didn't understand that this is completely won. Um, maybe black shouldn't do premature exchange, maybe they should like play for compensation, but it's nothing that really clear. Then I managed to preserve my pawns, this pawn is still a weakness, and I guess I could maybe hope to slowly unravel, maybe even play g4 in some moment. So yeah, either h3 or even knight c2 were better, but for some reason I went g3, and then he just took my pawn, and I legit didn't see that this pawn is hanging. Like, I, I literally missed this, like I was calculating all these variations with h3, g3, and then I guess I made some mental note that the pawn is on h3, and, but it was so, I only thought for two minutes, which is way too little. And he just took the pawn now, um, and now, okay, now I play knight c2, finally, getting the knight to better square. Here he played rook f7, and here I was very unnerved because I realized that I may be in some risk of losing, because rook f2 might come and I might be in some trouble. And here I spent the longest thing of my game. I stood for like six minutes, which doesn't sound that long, but that's how I think. And I went for rookie five. Uh, I was thinking about knight d4 here, and I calculated some lines after rook f2, knight e6, king f6, knight g5. But I really didn't want to allow this, and actually it turns out that this is that there is some potential draw. Uh, <laughs> but it's a crazy computer variation. Uh, and uh, the point of rook e5 is to okay, attack the bishop and also to be able to uh, go to b5 and then defend this b2 pawn. Uh, however, I and, and I was contemplating what would happen after rook f5. I thought this might be good for me because takes takes uh, rook f1. But here computer gives f4 pawn sacrifice. Uh, f4 bishop takes f4 and actually black is the one playing for the win with the outside passed pawn I didn't I failed to see that I can take the the the, the bishop I can't take the bishop because my king is in trouble so that was probably better by him and also if I take here then he plays here and then I don't have this rook b5 ideas anymore or anything and also the bishop is not hanging with check uh, I also thought king f6 rook b5 is good for me um, and yeah, like uh, if rook f2, I take on g5 and then I play rook b5, give up the knight, but defend the b2 pawn and this here white is doing very, very well. Uh, so he went bishop h6, he was very low on time here and I was maybe playing some, somewhat on his time trouble, which is not the best policy. So finally knight d4 came and this said knight is finally activated, rook f2, rook b5 defending and attacking. I think this is a really good maneuver, uh, irrespective of all the detail. I think this idea, rook e5, rook b5, I'm kind of proud that I found. And here he played b6, which was a, maybe a little bit passive. I was more worried about some e5, rook b7, king f6, you know, trying to be active with this pawn. Uh, we looked at this after the game, but uh, yeah, we weren't too convinced for black, on, although of course uh, the engine just gives equality. For example, after knight c6, uh, but you have to find this move bishop d2 and then e4 e3 idea and black has enough counterplay for a draw for example rook a7 i will just give some variation where there are usually perpetual checks or, or something along those lines so i was happy to see b6 because i thought okay then i take this e6 pawn i go back he plays bishop b3 i play a4 making some room for the king 
And this is still not too good because I still have some trouble with uh, my with uh, the bit to pawn. Uh, and yeah, th there is a big drawing tendencies in this rook endgame, like he can take on d4 and maybe go f for it at any moment. He played rook h, h to g2. And I play rook h1. I, I was actually taught quite a while here as well for seven minutes. I, w I was considering rook d3 as well to kind of maybe do something like this, but I wasn't sure about bishop d4, rook d4, rook g3, rook h5. Even though so the engine says this is how completely winning, probably because these pawns are too weak and the king is kind that can be checked. Um, but okay, rook h1 seems sensible to trying to attack this pawn, and here he kind of started drifting. He was very low on time, he had two minutes. I actually saw the move rook king g6. Uh, and the point here is that if I take, then he plays a6, and this rook can't keep protecting the b2 pawn and this rook, so it's a blunder. Uh, and I thought this was the best defense. I was planning to go rook h4, and then slowly, yeah, continuing from there, basically. But it still is very close to a draw. I mean, even after bishop d4, cd4, rook g3, rook h5, this should be draw, but suddenly uh, black's task is a little bit more complicated. Uh, here he played rook d3. And this is the wrong rook. It was better to move the other rook because it's important to have this rook to kind of block the check by this rook or to play rook h6 or rook h7. Uh, he played rook d3. Uh, by the way, also uh, rook g7 here I thought was okay. But rook h6, king f7, a5, b, b, b5, rook a5. Things are not straightforward. This pawn is weak. And yeah, I might get some sort of winning rook endgame. Instead, he played rook d3. And now I played rook h7, which is logical, attacking the pawn. But apparently rook h6, this check, which I didn't consider, king here and then rook d6 is stronger. Because after rook f7, yeah, the king is cut off. So yeah, the computer, by the way, gives an edge here for white. But I, I don't see a plan, to be completely honest. Maybe some sort of a5 and then trying to win the a7 pawn. But it's not easy. So probably it's still close to a draw, so I played the more human rook h7. And here he finally blundered. So he played super, super well. He was so close to his desired draw. And here if he played something like rook f5, then after rook f5, king f5, rook a7, uh, rook to d4, this is apparently dead draw, b, b3, king e6. And I can't really win with two pawns versus one and these pieces being so close. Uh, instead he played rook d4 and this is just a blunder because after rook a7, uh, I can win this version because this pawn is falling. Uh, and then I'll just get to play the best pawns. Rook deal. So basically, like he was playing, that, that's chess for you guys. He was playing like so good for 38 moves. Then he makes like one kind of mistake, rook d4, like very, very clear mistake. Although I like to think that I take some credit for putting him under pressure so consistently during the game. And I think that's also maybe this mentality, mentality of trying to draw too hard. But after rook d4, rook a7, rook d1, king a2, rook d6, rook b7, rook. Uh, f4 b3 here he resigned because b6 is falling and i just have a one uh, end game with two connected best pawns so yeah i'm not really sh sure what to say about this game uh, i mean yeah i mean I, I should be i think happy overall with it uh, it's very tough to be honest to play against these opponents where, where you you are sitting duck you you can't prepare at all and they can prepare anything they want uh, maybe I didn't approach it in the best way, but uh, I thought, okay, I wanted to feel comfortable, especially after I was, no more experiments. Uh, and yeah, this just goes to show you that, like, okay, sometimes, you know, if you play only one line and people prepare for it, it's tough. Like, he gets, yeah, like, he knew 20 moves of theory and I got no advantage, even though I knew the same theory as well. Although it is not the most combative variation. So yeah, I was really, really happy that in the end I could win. Like, it kind of was make it or break it game for the tournament. And as we will see, I kind of managed to end on a very high note. So this brings me to the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed another one from the road to nowhere series. Uh, feel free to check out the other ones. Uh, from Currently there are only ones from Groningen Open, but I will be uploading more as I play more. Uh, as usual, if you like the video, make sure to subscribe to the channel. I really appreciate it. Um, feel free to sh check some of the other content uh, in my videos. Uh, I can safely recommend that after this game, I think, kind of. And uh, yeah, stay tuned for more chess videos in the near future. Thank you for watching and bye bye.